Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Madeline DiNono. I have the privilege of serving as the CEO of the Institute. And I wanted to very quickly introduce our two ASL interpreters. We have Mara Bassani Santa Maria, and we also have Sharon Pierre Louis, who will be alternating every 20 minutes. Yoko Ono said, some people are old when they're 18. Some are young when they're 90. You can't define people by whatever society determines as their age, which themes into our topic for today, which is engaged as we age, changing the script um, on aging. I also wanna give a shout out to our partners at the Coronado Film Festival, um, who are also joining us uh, today. So a few just housekeeping things. Uh, Lisa Emery, who leads our social media, and Elizabeth Kilpatrick, who leads our development operations, are hanging in the chat room. So please feel free to post your questions uh, you know, throughout. And uh, we're also very thrilled to be partners with Tenna, who actually sponsored the research that you're going to hear today. So um, in a minute or two, we're gonna hear opening remarks um, from Tenna, followed by a research presentation by Dr. Caroline Heldman, who's our VP of Insights and Research, followed by our esteemed panel, and then we'll go into a Q and A. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, via video, uh, Meta Redstedt, who is the Global Master Brand and Communications Director at Tena, who is also leading their Ageless campaign. So I'm going to turn my video off uh, and we're going to take a look at her opening remarks. Thank you. Hello. My name is Meta Redstedt and I am the Global Master Brand and Communications Director for Tena. To a large extent, we talk to women 50 plus, and therefore we are extremely honored and proud to take part of this talk today. Tenna is a global leading incontinence brand, and we who work at Tenna, we are passionate about women's well-being. And we also know that the aspects of aging and of incontinence negatively affects women's self-image and our inner confidence. We try as much as we can in our work to contribute to an open and honest conversation about the issues of incontinence. But in this work, we have noticed that there is quite a common and very unhealthy misrepresentation of older women in mainstream media and in advertising. There is a lot of examples of stereotyping going on especially when it comes to portraying older women, our bodies, uh, how we look at intimate life and uh, older women's sex life. The reality is completely different in our minds. And we know because we talk to a lot of women around the world. So in our new campaign, we want to shine a light on this reality and share some experiences from older women how they look at their bodies on intimacy and their sex life. And by doing so, we hope that we will contribute to change society's perception of what it means to be a woman living with incontinence. Thank you so much, Meta. Really- I would um, change now. It's far less complicated. I know what I want. My skin still feels yeah, sensitive in a nice way, yeah. But because I'm comfortable in my body, I still feel sexy. Sex is just as much fun, as sensual as it ever was. I just feel re-energized afterwards and weak at the legs. <laughs> I also have incontinence, but it doesn't bother me. I call it my trickle of joy. I call it my sneeze wee. <laughs> Too much? 
well. It's not about you. It's about me. Very, very powerful campaign. And we're, again, so proud of the partnership with Tenna. And without further ado, I would like to bring on Dr. Caroline Heldman, who is the head of research and insights for the Institute, who will present the ageless test. Take it away, Caroline. Thank you, Madeline. Um, what an honor to work on a project, the first global project looking at representations of women ages 50 plus in media. Um, this is the title of the report that we've just put out, Frail, Frumpy, and Forgotten. Um, and let me dig into that. So you're all members, you know what we do at the Institute, but it's a cool photo of Gina. Um, jumping right into the research, we find that in, from a previous study that 77% of uh, older adults say that they experience some form of ageism. And so what we see on the, the big and little screens has a profound effect in shaping uh, the treatment of older people in real life. And so uh, the importance of this work is that it, it does affect our everyday lives. So we jumped into this study wanting to look at two primary things. The first is the erasure of older adults in media. Um, and again, we're cutting it at 50 plus. You could cut it at different ages, but if you're talking about Hollywood or advertising, um, they tend to cut it at a pretty low age where you start to see a big drop off. And so that's where we're focusing our efforts. And so looking at the erasure and the second component is um, how uh, folks ages 50 plus are represented. So the first is how often they're represented and the second is how they're represented. And to this end, um, we analyzed uh, over 1200 characters in the top 10 grossing films of 2019 from four different countries. So from Germany, France, the UK and the US. Uh, we used a team of 10 uh, expert human coders who went through a rigorous training process and an iterator reliability process to make sure uh, that the results were reliable. And we also uh, analyzed, used the GDIQ, the Gina Davis Inclusion Quotient, which is an automated tool to analyze screen time and speaking time for gender. And we present some data for age as well. So let me jump into our major findings uh, from the report, which you can find on our website. Um, first off, in order to baseline this, to have a comparison, um, people ages 50 plus are 28% of the population, uh, but make up 21.8% uh, of the characters. So you can see there's a significant gap between the presence of people ages 50 plus uh, in the real world and how they're showing up in terms of, of the top films. Um, so there's a, there's a significant underrepresentation. And we find even more so when it comes to uh, the amount of screen time that characters ages 50 plus receive. So um, just to, to put it back up, 28% of the population, um, but 16.9% of screen time and 21.8% of speaking time. Um, what does this mean? It means just to, to summarize, 28% um, of the population are ages 50 plus, um, but the number of characters is just around 22%. The speaking time is just around 22%, but then there's a big drop off in terms of who actually uh, appears on screen. So we find that characters ages 50 plus are underrepresented and when they show up, they're less likely to appear on screen than younger characters. Um, we also find that uh, in terms of how characters ages 50 plus are showing up, and we will narrow in on women in a moment because that's really the focus of the study. Um, but we find that overall uh, that a majority of characters ages 50 plus are shown with at least one stereotype. And in fact, most characters were shown with multiple stereotypes. The most common stereotypes are that older characters are stubborn, um, or cranky. In fact, one in three older characters showed up in these top films as being stubborn or cranky. Um, and then one in five uh, and about one in five uh, show up as unattractive and unfashionable. So uh, reinforcing these ideas of, you know, stubborn, cranky, kind of fuddy-duddy, frumpy uh, older characters, um, which of course does not reflect lived experience, it, it is, it is uh, reductive uh, and degrading to be presented in those ways. We also find in terms of uh, older characters 
uh, being shown with sexual partners, that they're far less likely to have sexual partners than uh, younger characters. And also uh, older characters are far less likely to be shown significantly less likely to be shown as uh, in a sex scene. Um, what we also found is that the sex scenes differ, so they're less likely to be explicit, um, meaning that um, older adults are not shown as being as sexual as younger characters, um, and when they are shown as uh, in, in um, a relationship, they're less likely to be shown having a sex scene, and that sex scene is less likely to be explicit. So um, it's this erasure of the sexuality of uh, older characters in the most popular films. Really zeroing in now on female characters, because what we found is that while older adults or older characters in films um, had many issues. Uh, older women actually, have, the issues are amplified in terms of their erasure uh, and uh, their stereotypical representation. So we found that female characters make up only 25% of characters ages 50 plus, which means that three in four characters uh, ages 50 plus that you're seeing in the most popular films are men. Only one uh, in four are women. We also found, um, shockingly, that 0% of the leads ages 50 plus are women. So while we are seeing an underrepresentation of male leads ages 50 plus, we're seeing a complete erasure of female leads ages 50 plus in the top films in these four countries. And then comparing older women to older men, so 50 ages 50 plus, um, we find that uh, older women are four times more likely to be shown as senile, seven times more likely to be shown as homebound, that is in their homes or unable to leave or, or uh, just shown as not being out in the world, if you will. Uh, women are also four times more likely to be shown as being feeble and four times more likely to be shown as frumpy. So again, to reiterate, while, old, while older characters ages 50 plus in general are stereotyped and underrepresented, older women are particularly so. Um, we also uh, came up with the ageless tests, which looks at the representation of uh, women ages 50 plus in content. And the test is twofold. One, uh, does the film have a prominent character or does a piece of content, film, ads, television, episode, does it have a prominent uh, woman ages 50 plus in a leading or supporting role? And then is she represented in a non-stereotypical way? So we find that only one in four films uh, out of the top films have passed the ageless test. In, in other words, they have a woman who's ages 50 plus who is shown in a non-stereotypical manner. Uh, about half uh, have women ages 50 plus, but they are shown as stereotypes. Um, and about another quarter, 28.2% have no female characters ages 50 plus, which is remarkable. Um, in terms of our recommendations for moving forward, first, <laughs> cast more women ages 50 plus. Um, our second recommendation is based upon a deeper dive into the data. What we found is that uh, older characters, but especially older female characters are less likely to be shown as diverse. So of course we look, all of our research is intersectional. We look at race, uh, ability, sexuality, and body size. Um, in addition to gender and age. And we find that older characters are simply less diverse than younger characters. And so uh, it would behoove um, folks, content creators to really look at casting more diversity uh, across the board with characters ages 50 plus, but especially women. Also avoid stereotyping older characters. Um, this is a, a massive market. Uh, if, if nothing else is driving this, let the money drive it, right? Uh, better representations of older characters mean uh, more viewers for the content. Um, and then allow older characters, but especially older women, to be shown as sexual. It's a, a full, uh, it's a part of showing uh, older characters as being fully human, right? Because sexuality is such a profound part of the human experience. And so allow that humanity to shine through, uh, through the sexuality of older women characters. And with that, I will uh, pass the baton back to Madeline Denono, our CEO. Thank you, Carolyn. And we'd love to hear from all of you. I know you're hearing this for the first time, but if there's any thoughts or comments that pop into your head, uh, we'd love to know what you think. 
Uh, as Caroline mentioned, this research is now available on our website. Our goal is to take this around the world to present. So if you'd like us to present to your company or your team, uh, particularly for any of you who are writers or in development, you know, please let us know. And so now I'm going to invite our esteemed panelists to join us. Um, and you can all turn your cameras on. Uh, we have um, award-winning actor Tantu Cardinal, uh, very well known for her work in Dances with Wolves in Stumptown. We have Lisa Bruce, um, uh, Academy Award uh, nominated uh, producer for The Theory of Everything and The Darkest Hour. We have Melanie Hoyes with the British Film Institute, who is the industry inclusion executive, and she's also our Europe Council lead for the Institute. And last but not least, we have uh, Academy Award and Golden Globe nominated Anne Carey, pre president of production um, for Archer Gray. So I want to thank all of you so much uh, for joining us today. And um, I mean, these are really startling. It's like, have some ageism with your coffee this morning. Um, so Tantu, I'm actually going to start with you. And I saw in one of your interviews, you said, I got into acting through my political involvement through a sense of justice. I wanted to see things change to offset some of the lies that have been told about us throughout history. And so given your storied and um, uh, memorable career in the industry with over 120 films uh, in your um, legacy, can you give us a little insight on your journey? Uh, what made you want to pursue a career in acting and just any insights that you've gleaned um, over the years? Welcome Tantu. Thank you so much. It is a great honor to be sitting here amongst all you amazing women. And um, particularly with, for the work that uh, Gina's been doing and her amazing talent. And presence um, is greatly appreciated. Um, I got into to acting in search of something that I could contribute to make change. Um, I was, <clears throat> let's see, okay. Uh, I was born quite a while ago. I was born in 1950. And so there's been an enormous amount of change since then. Um, there, was, is a great need for change, emancipation, justice, and to change the, the reality and the truth of who we are. I think a really good example of what we as Indigenous people and particularly Indigenous women have had to wade through, live through, get through, for for as many years as this this country has been in existence in that um look what's going on today with all of those people that are trump crazy and it's based on lies that's the very same thing that's happened to our people um, you know, there's a lot of people that are running around this country now saying that the election was unlawful. Um, and so I guess the equivalent would be for us is that the treaties were for the Europeans to go ahead and take the land. That's not what the treaties were. This was about sharing, about sharing this land, sharing this life, sharing this resources, sharing the the wealth that was possible in the civilization. And that has never been done. That's one of the lies that's at the base of 
the, um, the society and the civilization that we've have had to live through since the Euros came here and opened up the land. Free land, everyone, free land. Nobody's here, nobody's on it. Meanwhile, what happened to our people? Where are the people, where were the people that were on that land? But the people coming in, they don't know. Now they're being fed fear. You know, they're supposed to fear us because we are uncivilized and we're savage. Uh, what would anybody do when their land and their home and their children and everything was being taken over by people on the outside? So there's a whole mass of lies in this foundation of this civilization that's going on right now. And I think that people can look at what's happening in Trump country and they can pick the lies and then they can see how those lies manifest into the civilization, into the psyche of the people that are a part of it. And uh, so it's been very, very difficult for, uh, say for an actor like myself, because within the minds of all these people who have taken it all, have taken the control and they'll open the door, allow you in into their room where there's a camera. And, you know, it has just been on the outside from the very beginning. And acting was the only thing that I could do because I refused to go into their institutions. I refused uh, college and university and all those things because at that time there was not even a positive poster on the wall about us. We were uncivilized, we're primitive, of lesser intelligence, and capable of looking after our own lives. These are the things that we have had to break through. Okay, back, you know, and there was, there's a whole story there. But to talk about ageism, um, in, in my world, in my community, um, when a woman gets to say the age of menstruation, she becomes more powerful. She becomes uh, she becomes another. Um, uh, she's graduated to another level in our society. She can now freely be a part uh, of the ceremonies and, and we don't retire. Our elders are working with our children until they die. That is written in our constitution that our elders are to be respected. And so it's been with great frustration that I have come through and lasted so long in this industry. It was just P plain bullheaded, no, you're not going to shut me up. You're not going to quiet me down. No, I'm going to bring as much as I possibly can with what's allowed in this moment. And I'm really grateful uh, that now things are kind of opening up more so that I can actually say these things. Um, to people that are outside of my culture and outside of my community and even in the business that I am in. And it's always with great hope that someone will be able to really drive through the, um, the depth of density that is the foundation of, of what we walk on as, as women, you're well acquainted with that. But as indigenous women, we are on another level altogether. As, as we were not included in, in two very important documentaries that have been done on women just in the past few years, as an indication of the absolute, um, it's like a, an automatic reaction that we don't matter. As indigenous women, we don't matter and people don't know us. And that was a tactic because this land that we have built this powerful, rich 
society on, this civilization on, um, that's what we're part of. Our blood and our bones are connected to everything that's the earth. We're connected to that fire at the core of Mother Earth. In my language of Cree, escoteo, that word fire is made up of two words, esco, which is woman, and mete, which is heart. So fire is woman's heart. And look what was been done with that word esco, that's woman. It's been turned into squaw. And look at everything that happens to your mind when you hear squaw. What does that mean? That's what I came out of. I came out of a squaw and I am a squaw every day, every day. And in this industry that has not turned itself upside down to try to change that idea. Um, so that's what we're working on. I mean, it, and it's really hard not to get absolutely um, like this about it because it is, um, it shouldn't be allowed anymore. I think we've got to pull a halt to separating indigenous women away from everyone else. And when you consider that the, the, the uh, suffragettes got their inspiration from our women and uh, women are wearing white and, but do they know what white represents? in the Iroquoian society. You know, there's so much that's not known because our filmmakers are not telling our stories and it's very, very difficult as, a, as an actor to come in and bring any, any huge um, changes of significance. It's really kind of minimal what you can um, kind of add to the pot as something, oh, um, maybe you didn't know this kind of thing. So um, I think writers are in a better position to, to really make the massive changes, but the circle is, is what we have to really um, bring back to the fore because that's been our formation um, circle. Our, our, our formation shape is the circle and uh, all of our wisdom and everything that we come together with happens in the circle. Thank you so much. Um, I want to build on some of the things that you said in terms of hope, inclusion, and particularly taking control of your destiny. And uh, Lisa, I'm going to um, throw over to you. Um, there was a comment that you made. Uh, so the women is ornamental. And I'd love for you to kind of talk about that. Um, what's the story behind those profound words? And can you talk to us a little bit uh, as your experience as a producer over the years, many of your projects have, have featured um, older cast members that were extremely successful. Uh, so I'd love to turn it over to you and hear your thoughts. And of course, please feel free to respond to anything, um, to any of the words that, that Tantu said. And for any of you who wanna jump in and make a comment, you know, please, by all means do so. But Lisa, over to you. Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm quite honored to be part of this. It's really unique. It's unique to grab a bunch of amazing women that you all are and have us all have this discussion. And Tentu, you had really powerful words. And, um, you know, you're speaking to the marginalization, not just of women, but women of age, but certainly of Aboriginal women who've largely been dismissed from the canvas. Um, my my statement that women are ornamental, I, I've made to a, a female, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, a male studio head at one point because I was so frustrated trying to explain how limited the female, even the lead, right? The female lead was in a script and it was just this frustrating thing. But I finally said, you know, she's, she's an ornament. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, she has no agency in the story. It doesn't, she's not affecting anything that actually happens in the plot or in the story. And women so much, at least in my career, in, inside the script, and we all know sort of it starts with that, right? 
they're often have been written by men um, and they are, they are there largely and have been there largely in so many major films. They're there to accessorize the male, right? We need Harrison Ford to be married. So we cast a female and she's typically much younger uh, than he or, or Clint Eastwood or Kevin Costner or name a number of them. It's, it's just this, this general idea. And largely it's because the gatekeepers, as we know, the gatekeepers that are making the choices are largely men. So it's not that there's any kind of evil plan. It's just that they, they have such a limited perspective, I think, on what women are and the layers and the complications of women. And that has been pervasive throughout our media. And I, I sort of think of a lot of female characters, it's like they could be in a glass case, like a sculpture. They could be a, a, a bouquet of flowers in the scene. And it's, it's upon us now. And I do agree. I mean, Ten Tu said that lovely thing, which is you now feel like you can say some of these things more than you would have in the past. Judging by your personality, I bet you said them anyway in the past, which I love. But um, it's it's really, I really do think it's changing. And it really is the first time in my career that I would say, oh, it, it's, it's definitely, there's so many more layered women now on television. Partly this is due to streaming. You know, we exist in such a, our industry in the US is is largely not very subsidized and it's largely based on a really, you know, capitalistic structure. So it's based on profit. And if, if the gatekeepers and the ones that are deciding what gets made are largely men and largely heterosexual and largely white, those are the visions that we have all lived with. And we, we are watching them erode just a little bit and we need to be part of the activity of eroding them more. Um, I, I had a, 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 it was a major film and it was being made by a major director and the script was largely around a male character, historical character, <clears throat> but his wife in, in real life, in history, had a lot to say in the world and she was quite powerful. The writer had not really gotten his head around her yet and we were still trying to make her a fully fleshed character but the the director went out ahead of time sort of on his own to a major actress who luckily for us said um if you take me out if you take my character out of this story nothing changes so i'm passing and that was enough to get everybody to go oh ooh, maybe maybe you're right maybe you and the writer are right that we still need to work on her otherwise she was fine you know what i mean from some people's perspectives She's fine. She's in a few scenes. She has a few lines of dialogue, but it was really a smart comment and it was exactly true. And that, so again, that came from an actress who, who meant something, who was a financeable element, but because she said that it sort of brought that subject to the forefront. And I think it starts with the female producers and it starts with female producers trying to find sometimes female writers, but also I work with male writers and they'll sometimes say to me, what would she say? what would this character say? And I do appreciate that because, you know, they're at least leaning to the fact that that isn't their world, right? And they're asking about it as opposed to, we can just have her, again, accessorize the scene. So that's what I, I, I mean by it. And I'm really glad that it is changing. Um, we have, you know, shows like Dead to Me, two fantastic female leads who are very different and really fun. And you have Stranger Things, which is a, a young female girl. I mean, even in our history, we would all say, even the children in stories and sometimes the younger characters, the boy in the family has so much more agency than the girl. So it starts way back then. But then when you get up into older women, we just like that study just showed, we get so much more diminished, right? When a woman's like not in the, what is again, male gatekeeper's decision of what is sexy, you know, you, you'll have a 55 year old male lead and someone hands you a casting list while you're looking for the female, for the wife or the girlfriend. And my line is often, is this for the daughter, right? Because they're all so young. And it's like, wouldn't we be fresh if we actually cast people in a similar age range? Because there are men that do marry women that are in their similar age range, but not in media 
not in most mass media. So I think it's that it starts with us and it starts with the, there's also, I know male studio execs who have said to me, yeah, we need to change this because it's, it's become, we're, we are 53% of the population and we're represented in a, a, a very marginalized way, I would say compared to that. And they're starting to see as they, you know, it was funny when Gina's film, of course, Thelma and Louise came out, everybody remembers the game changed. Everybody said the game's changed now. That movie made so much money. Then it quickly afterwards same, somehow became an anomaly. Well, that particular movie did well, but, and we have still been battling that, but more and more now because of streaming, I think you're seeing so many female led media, whether they're shorts or, I mean, whether they're episodes of television or features make really solid money. And that then changes the game for all of us. Um, but again, I think it's, and I, and I particularly think um, people of color and um, LGBTQ, there's just, it's just a constant, I mean, we still are very sort of white heterosexual media that we're putting out. And I think we just have to constantly question that and continue, and plus films become more interesting as, as does television when it's more diverse and it looks more like the world around us. So that's what I'm finding to be exciting. And some of the films that I've done with older, with older actors, obviously Darkest Hour is one. Um, there's a lot of gain to that obviously because it's a real character and real historical. But, but what was interesting about Winston Churchill is at a time when people would typically be retiring or sort of settling into, or he was like in his twilight years, he took on with a very large ego he took, he grabbed hold of the steering wheel and he had real agency at a time that was almost built for him, this incredible cooking pot time. And it was um, that writer, Anthony McCartan, that took a really a six week period and made that into a boiling pot. So I think that it was the framing of that story, the power of Churchill. But what was great about that, he's also married to a woman his age, you know, and and she was powerful and she had a lot to do with his politics. She had a lot to do with what he did in the political realm. So that's powerful. Um, I'm, I'm doing a series, which I think we'll get around to, but there's a, there's a couple um, episodes, there are a couple, they're, they're feature length, but they are older characters and those are also quite um, doing quite well and seem to be getting a lot of traction. So I hope it's changing because also the, the other thing of like that, that study was saying, you know, okay, we don't just want to be showing people in their seventies and eighties who are the grumpy person who are homebound. I mean, I know so many people who are older and they're fascinating to me. They're more fascinating than everybody I know is younger because they have so much history and they have so much to tell us. Like Tentu was talking about with elders. I just think we need to put it in media so younger people and even people and people our age start to understand the power of an elder, the power of somebody who has the history that we don't yet have. Thank you so much, Lisa. And, um, you know, I want to uh, jump over to uh, Mel Hoyes because we're jumping over the pond uh, because this is a global conversation when we think about ageism in media. Although, uh, Mel, I do think there's, much more respect or acceptance uh, for older people and particularly older actors um, over in Europe, particularly the UK, than there is in the US. But um, for many of our members who may not know much about uh, the British Film Institute and your longstanding diversity and inclusion um, initiatives, I'd love for you to share that because I believe you are the largest um, government um, funding entity in the world um, for filmmakers, uh, which people may not know that. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your role, how you got into your role, and what is it that um, BFI is doing um, with these DNI, you know, initiatives. Um, that I would love for you to share that. Sure. Hi, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be here representing the UK. Um, 
Yeah, so the BFI is kind of a strange beast. It does lots of different things, including um, using public money to fund productions um, throughout the life cycle of a film, actually. Um, but we're also an archive and a library, and we're also exhibitors because wow. we have a cinema down on our South Bank. So we do a lot of stuff. Um, so it kind of seems um, ridiculous not to be involved in, in thinking about how that industry can be more inclusive and more representative. So um, we set up the diversity standards um, about, I think it was 2016, it was the three ticks before that it shifted into the diversity standards. And we're really interested in creating interventions that shift the dial. So not thinking up schemes or anecdotally thinking there's a problem with the pipeline over here or maybe it's about trainees over here. We really wanted to embed a set of standards that the industry could use that thought about every aspect of production and how you might be more inclusive in um, your crewing up, in your recruitment, in your script, in your cast. Um, so the diversity standards, uh, are, there are four of them. The standard A is around um, representation on screen. So not only the number of people from um, protected groups on screen, but also the nuance in the story, whether they are stereotyped um, uh, portrayals or not. Standard B is around creative decisions and heads of department. Um, what does the film look like? Who gets to make those decisions? What's it about? Standard C is compulsory and that's around mentoring and training opportunities and pipeline as well as progression. So it's also about who you're promoting um, on your set. And standard D is for more for our audience fund, but that's around um, kind of audiences and distribution, who you're reaching with your stories, um, you know, what thought have you given to reach as many people as possible. So it's really across the entire pipeline. Um, and I came into this work because I did some research around representation on screen, um, looking at our archive and um, at, at gender initially uh, in our filmography. So it's a database of British films and looking at gender on screen and off screen. So we did a big data um, exercise to put gender on all of the credits in our catalog so that we could tell the story, the history of the UK film industry from the, through the lens of gender. Um, and then I was brought on board to look at ethnicity as well on screen, uh, which is a bit harder to do in a big data way. So that took a lot of kind of manual research to do that work. So I really am interested in using data, not just to have these initiatives and schemes um, that we then sort of throw on the bonfire of good intention, but how do we use that data to understand whether we are pushing the needle um, in terms of DNI, in terms of representation, and how we can adapt what we're doing to be more effective? So that's us. <laughs> and um, do you find that there are there is an abundance, or there is a significant um, submission from um, filmmakers who are, you know, 50 plus? I mean, do you see that increasing, decreasing, staying the same since you've launched that? So we have um, our film fund, actually all of the women who uh, make the decisions are 50 plus women. So they're, in, they're particularly interested in this. So our representation in that regard isn't bad. Um, we have targets on who we fund um, across gender, ethnicity, disability, and LGBTQ+. Um, and actually for the last few years since we've been publishing that data online, we've been hitting our targets in terms of writers, producers, producers and directors that we fund um, that are women. So last year we were actually exceeding that target of 50%, we're at 56%. And about 10% of those are 50 plus. Um, sorry, about 20% of those are 50 plus, about 10% all, all in. Um, so I think we have a real, and the, you know, our development execs are really interested in those stories. We've developed some really good talent like Joanna Hogg and Cleo Bernard that we've worked with Sally Potter. Um, so I think we're doing okay. We are sort of more of an independent film realm. So I think we do get um, sort of those stories and our funding priorities are really around um, funding different stories and stories that are that are interesting and haven't been told before because there's a whole industry that can tell other stories um, and, and have private money to do that so and because we are publicly funded we're really keen 
to represent the people that are paying for the content that we make. So, um, so yeah, I think we're, we're doing quite well in terms of our gender targets. I think what we're interested in next and where we go to next and what we'd like the data to be able to show us a bit more is how we're doing intersectionally. Because I think as Lisa was saying, um, you know, a lot of the women that we're funding are likely to be from a certain background and, and are white and heterosexual. So I think um, we're, we'd be interested in over the next few years to see, have a more intersectional approach and in how we're thinking about these things and really just be, understand the nuance of identity and, and the kind of um, allow people to tell their every story. Because I think, you know, that, that research is so interesting why are we continually telling the same stereotypical stories when there are so many stories to tell and we know how sort of interesting and nuanced people's identities are so it seems kind of crazy i think we're all bored of that it seems mad that we're still perpetuating those stereotypes um so yeah we're interested in kind of opening that out and allowing everybody to tell their every story well again bfi is definitely a beacon uh for the rest of the world and for those countries that do have government funding, I think it's one of the you know, best models that we've ever seen. So uh, in terms of kind of breaking stereotypes, uh, taking control of their destiny, and I'm gonna turn over um, to you because um, you lead Archer Gray, um, you have a very storied career, um, you made a decision that you wanted to go out on your own, build your own you know, enterprise, if you can really talk a little bit about what made you become a storyteller. And also you could have easily just run any studio you wanted, but you had a voice and you wanted to go out on your own. So if you could just share with us a little bit about um, your story and talk a little bit about um, the formation of Archer Gray. Sure, and thank you for having me here on this panel and uh, all of these women who've spoken before me have had such rich, important things to say. I, I'm really happy to be part of the conversation. Um, I think in terms of my own trajectory um, as a young woman and in the industry, my first job working at a big talent agency and then subsequently working um, at a, with a producer with a studio deal, I've had terrific female mentors. I've had very generous uh, female mentors who, um, shared with me and brought me into the world uh, in a way that I don't think male, you know, male, I haven't had those sort of male mentors. So I've been lucky. So I feel that there's a, a responsibility to pay back the mentorship that I was given, um, telling stories that are interesting to women by women. And then when I moved into producing, and I worked at a company called Good Machine that was an independent film company, we believe that films, independent films, art house films, smart house films, uh, who goes to see those films are decisions made by women. Women read the reviews, women bring their, drag their husbands along. So we were always sort of female focused in our, in our storytelling there, whether it was a female character or not at the center were these stories that women were gonna find authentic and true and come towards. So that's been, uh, I think those have been two sort of guiding principles of how I you know, shaped my career as a producer. And then for many years, I was partnered with uh, men who were my contemporaries and who remained my friends. But the ability to join Archer Gray to work with Amy and Iacus, um, you know, who comes out of the venture capital world and built her own, you know, business. It's not her husband's money. It's not her father's money. She really built the business of Archer Gray on her own. And I was so impressed with her and her business acumen and her fearlessness um, to just be woman first, uh, you know, venture capitalist second, a creative person and partner and sounding board with me. And it's been terrific to grow the company. And we are primarily a female driven company. I think we have two men in the company. Um, and it's been about telling the stories that we wanna hear and that we wanna get out there. That's really been the, the principle. Um, and staying independent has allowed us to make those um, decisions. I think we've just never backed down from it. Thank you um, so much. So um, 
We have so many um, questions that I think we're going to go to Q&A, but I did just want to do a round robin with all of you um, to really talk about uh, impact of your work using your voice. Um, Tantu, I just want to go back to you for a minute. Um, you know, what are the stereotypes or tropes that you would like to see permanently, you know, buried, you know, from the industry? And then I would just love for all of you, if you just want to talk about, uh, I mean, we have talked about that there's hope there is change, but if there's something specific, a story tied to your work, uh, something that had great impact, I would just love you, love for you to share that. And then we'll try to hit um, a few questions. And then for those of you who we can't get to your questions, as long as we have your email address, we'll make sure we reach out to our panelists and get your questions answered. So um, Tantu, I'm just gonna kick it back over to you and then just kind of do a quick uh, round robin and we'll see if we can squeeze in a question or two. Some of the stereotypes that just are persistent and insistent are based on those lies. So if, um, if the creators could kind of look at their base and see where they're getting their information from, that would be um, very helpful because we have the, the woman who's four steps behind her husband. And we also have the fierce woman with... Uh, with a knife in her boot, who's dangerous. Um, we have, a, a, there's, a, I mean, in, in 50 years in this business, it was so difficult to get a scene that I could move. You know, I, 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 there was just no power and no force. And it was many, many decades that all of the medicine people had to be men first, and then it started to switch over to women. So, I mean, there's, there's just a myriad of um, misinformation in characters that are not respected. So I can't, I can't list one or the other. It's just a mass of them. Thank you. So I'll just throw to anyone else who wants to comment. I know Lisa, you did talk about a specific example on one of your films where you were able to alter uh, the female character, but just for, you know, Anne or Mel, um, Lisa, any, th any particular projects um, that you felt had kind of a more of a tipping point, um, tremendous impact that you're particularly proud of? I mean, I, I'm proud of a movie I made a few years ago called Can You Ever Forgive Me that starred uh, Melissa McCarthy and Richard E. Grant. And it it took a long time to get that movie made. I started trying to make it in 2008, I think, originally, when I acquired the life rights and the memoir of Lee Israel. And at the time, I was pretty much told by the marketplace that there was no interest in a movie about an uh, angry 50-year-old woman who, you know, felt too highly, you know, th who thought highly of herself, and that we should just, we wouldn't never get it made. And by the time we eventually got it made, I felt the world was ready to hear Lee Israel. I felt the industry was ready. And I think the audience was ready to see a movie by, you know, and who was smart, who was articulate, who was passionate, who was irate. And Melissa McCarthy helped get that movie across the screen. But I was very interested to see, and maybe it was, you know, with the year of Hillary Clinton, I think it came out in 2016. So I think the change that made that happened culturally that finally made that movie possible you know that was an, an interesting intersection and I continue to feel those kind of intersections. I recently worked with an actress on a movie and the, she was, had to do something in her house while she was waiting for her daughter to get ready and she said somebody had said well why don't you just fold some laundry and she said I'm never folding laundry on screen. I will never fold laundry on screen. That's not what I do and I thought that was a great piece of progress you know. Um, I think it's also the audience that has to remember to push for these things and to demand these things and their content. I was in a bathroom once after a screening of a movie that I had made that starred a 50 year old woman. And I heard two women who had sort of been at the screening say to one another, well, if the studio really thought that movie was important they would have cast somebody younger. And so we 
also need to change. You know, we as women, we as audience members, as we teach our children, teach our partners, teach our friends to see the truth, that's also our responsibility. Thank you. Mel, Lisa? Well, I'm doing this series now. Uh, I was brought in uh, by Blumhouse to do this series. It is a series, they're all individual feature films, but they're, the mandate really is diverse filmmakers. So it's women, people of color, LGBTQ. And it, for a lot of them, it's their first feature. Um, but the structure is such that we have a lot of industry support around them. And that's a, a structure that was completely created by Blumhouse for Amazon, for streaming on Amazon Prime. And my experience with it, and they're all, you know, uh, fairly uh, low budget and, and uh, efficient and shot in very few days. Um, and, but they're all original and we're giving all these filmmakers a total opening the door and letting them step in and get a feature film made. And everybody on this panel will understand this. They're not just getting a feature film made, they're getting feature film made that they know will be marketed well and it will have distribution and a ton of people will see it. So that is such a step up for so many filmmakers. So eight filmmakers will be in the industry now that would not have otherwise necessarily had that opportunity, maybe for years and maybe ever, because we all know it's a little bit of luck to get one that people actually see. And you know, we made a movie called Black Box, which is a, a wholly almost African-American cast starring, I mean, Felicia Rashad, just in terms of the older actors. And none, that film is not about being black. And that is refreshing to me. And that was refreshing to Jay Ellis, who's an African-American actor, who was a, the creative producer along with Aaron Bergman, who brought that film to Blumhouse. You know, and it's it's a it's about real characters struggling with family issues and and amnesia and trying to raise a child. You can't even remember she's your child. That's what it's about. And they happen to be African American. And there is another movie, Evil Eye, which is a it's all East Indian characters. But again, it's not just about that. It's really about a, it's a mother daughter story, and. That's just so refreshing, right? You're not going, oh, that, that's, what a, that's what a black character would do. That's what an, an Indian character would do. That's even what a female character would do. And the manor is um, all based in, a, in an, uh, a nursing home starring Barbara Hershey and Ruth Davidson. So you have these older actors that get to have this fun in a, in a psychological thriller world with Supernatural. Um, but it, it, it deals with the issues of ageism and it deals with the marginalization of older people, you know, in the context of something that you can sell that's entertaining. And that, I just think those kind of things are, are really, um, it's, it's really interesting to me that a structure has been set up that allows so many of these fresh ideas to get out there fairly quickly. We've done all of them in, in sort of a, the span of uh, 17 months. So. It's great. And that, that I think other people can do that. And that can exist now in this world. So we get more and more voices in the color wheel. Again, another great, great model. Uh, Mel, any comments from you? Just, um, yeah, just quickly. I think that the data is to get back to the data because I'm the data nerd, but I think it is really interesting to see in our own data around gender. Uh, we did some comparison with sort of uh, portrayals on screen of unnamed characters and, and kind of workforce. So there was a stat that uh, something like 14% in the entire filmography, so from 1911 to the present day, 14% of the uh, people called a doctor on screen were women, whereas it's something like 54% of GPs in the UK are women. So this kind of idea that we're even just like showing what is reality is completely blown out of the water. Um, it, we're, we're absolutely rooted in, in this industry and kind of stereotypical, but for some reason in comparison with old stories and, and you know, kind of shorthand. And I just think we're, we're all rolling our eyes looking at the data that was there before about grumpy old women who don't have, you know, like we know that this isn't true. So I think imagery is persuasive. It's really dangerous actually to perpetuate those negative stereotypes. And I just think we're all ready for kind of new stories um, and, and more authentic stories actually. 
I believe so. And Tantu, I think you had a, uh, a story or an example or something you wanted to share with us. Yes, I, I didn't want to leave with the impression that it's all dark and bad. Um, a friend of mine who's been an executive director of Imaginative Film Festival, which has been one of our most uh, successful film festival, he's been the director for uh, 17 years and he said the majority of the storytellers and filmmakers are women in, in our world of Indigenous filmmaking. So sit back. But one, um, I mean, there's some really wonderful, wonderful storytellers you haven't seen yet. And it's, it's very exciting to consider. But um, I, was, I made my uh, first film where I played the lead that carried the story uh, two years ago. Um, an Anishinaabek filmmaker, Darlene Neponce, wrote, created, and shot this film in her community. And um, I played a woman who came back to her community and, and carried um, what that outside world had her burdened with. And, and so it's not necessarily an, an Indigenous woman, it happens to be her community but it was so refreshing to be able to play a character with edges and depths and, and ideas and, and a way of making it through her difficulties on her own. So I just wanted to leave that with you and, and let you know that we have some amazing filmmakers that it's frustrating you haven't had an opportunity to see yet. That's the distribution system we got. Thank you so much. So I'm going to bring on uh, Jasmine Barad, who leads all of our events. And unfortunately, we only have time for two questions. But again, if you give us your email address with your question, we will absolutely send you an email with the answer. Go ahead, Jasmine. Yeah, thank you. We have so many amazing questions coming in. Like Malin said, I'll make sure to follow up with all of you to make sure we get these answered if we can't get to them live now. Um, so I'm just gonna pick a few and um, read them to you. So, do you think we do ourselves a disservice by lying about our age? If more people in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s who are active, vibrant, creative, and engaged actually owned their age, would the media begin to realize that it's not necessary to be young to be relevant? The combination of young and old working together can make magic. I would answer yes. I think it's really great when people do. I think it's great sometimes when older women lead with their age. You know, I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis gets on things and goes, I'm 60, you know, and she just says it and it's, and she's beautiful and amazing and vibrant. And I think that gives, uh, again, it adds agency to, you, you know, of course you matter. And of course you have as much power, if not more, just because of your experience. So I do think it's great if women and men do lead with that as opposed to undercutting it. The, the film that Darlene put me in, I mean, I'm obviously an older woman and um, she had a lot of suggestions that she, she um, hire a younger, a, a younger actress to play this because of um, having lovers. Mm -hmm. But thankfully she was tenacious and she just did not take that for an answer. Great story. I agree. I feel if women, if we portray women on screen appropriate to their age, if we don't cast a 35 woman year old woman to play a 55 year old woman, if everybody plays the age that they are, we begin to break the expectations of what it looks like. I think it's very important. Great. Um, here's another question. Um, I'm wondering if there are efforts to address giving opportunities to the generation of female directors who have been slogging away making underfunded independent projects for decades. Mm -hmm. It seems that now many are falling in the cracks, for example, with trainee initiatives that are mainly geared toward those doing their first features. Um, so 
the BFI, we have a, a trainee, uh, pro well, it's not a trainee program, but it's uh, our network program, which is about emerging filmmakers, and there is no age limit on that. So actually, um, it allows uh, people to apply at whatever point in their career to get funding from us. And I think we're quite clear in terms of our funding, um, you know, that we're not, we try not to have trainee schemes that are just towards people that you know that stop at 18 or whatever so we're really trying to address that kind of um you know lost generation of people who kind of came into the industry and weren't given the support that they that they needed and you know trying to bring back people as well who, who felt like they had to leave so it's a real issue but we we try and address that by not putting age limits on our schemes And I think as more and more women get opportunities, which is happening, uh, they and there it won't be again that with the situation that's been for most of our careers, I would say is that a woman gets a chance rarely to make a movie. And then there's the sophomore picture seems to not happen. And again, I think that is largely due to sort of the, the male system. And as that starts to erode and change, more and more women get opportunities and particularly now in streaming and particularly in television, and then they get rehired and then they hire another woman. So I do, I do think that is changing and women will have more and more opportunities. Well, thank you everyone. I am so sorry we are out of time, but very, very seriously, uh, if, uh, if you give us your email um, with your name and your question, we will absolutely follow up with all of our uh, panelists. And I just want to say thank you so much. Um, also, thanks to our wonderful ASL interpreters, um, Mara and Sharon. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you so much and have a great week. Bye, everybody. Thank thanks, everybody. Thank thanks. you all. Bye. Yeah.